introduce Dr. Meryl Turpin to you. Actually, it's my pleasure just to see you all. I haven't gotten a chance to see all of you all. So, um, to introduce Dr. Meryl Turpin, we are sort of e-buddies. She has an interest in clinical reasoning, which is my area of research and scholarship. And she actually is the person who headed a team at the university in Australia that developed a fieldwork form that's kind of like our level two fieldwork forms. And it was so popular that everybody else wanted to join it. And so there's been iterations, and she's got recent publications about validating that, that form that's the equivalent to our fieldwork form for all of Australia. So she has this real interest in sort of reasoning and practice and helping practitioners become better practitioners when they're out in practice. Um, I have a clinical a group of, uh, you know, I, my own personal clinical reasoning network. Yeah, we've got a group of folks that have been networking around the world for a while. And so it was very exciting to me that Meryl wanted to come because we'd actually never met each other. We had sort of emailed and been back and forth. And when she heard that we were having the Clinical Reasoning Scholars Network at AOTA conference, she's like, oh, I want to come. And I said, seriously? I said, Meryl, is this a meeting? Of she goes, no, I want to come. I'm like, well, cool. And so we said, well, why don't you come early? So she and her husband, Ian, have been staying with us in Athens for this week. And then we're all going up to Nashville together. And then I guess we'll cut the umbilical cord for a while and then we'll yeah. go back. But she's a marvelous scholar, very knowledgeable in qualitative research, as well as, as, as you know, this field of assessment, as well as advanced practice. But what I asked her to talk with you all about, although I think she's happy to answer anything, was just sort of OT in Australia, so you can get kind of a feel for what life is like over in Australia, which is a wonderfully cool country if you've never been there. I highly recommend it. So here's Carol. Dr. Turpin, excuse me. Thank you, Dad. I'm Meryl, really. Yeah. <laughs> but it sounds a bit loud, so I don't know how to that. Um, okay, I'm just going to, I can't see everyone, but. Um, yeah, so I was just going to uh, talk to you about Australia. And I did this for the other campus. Um, and it's funny because now that I'm doing it, now that I've been here for a while, I've got a much better sense of like what you do in America. So, yeah, so I have to do that. So she did some modifications. She's like, oh, <laughs> now I see how it's different. Yeah. So anyway, here's Australia. Um, I just thought I'd start with the map so that you could see. Um, this one shows the states in Australia. So we've got, I think there's six states and two territories. So, um, no, you can't see. Oh, I could probably, no, it's like the worst. So apart from the uh, the one in the middle at the top there, the kind of orangey terracotta one, the rest are all states. And the one in the middle at the top there, that's called the Northern Territory. And then, in the blue one called New South Wales, a little area called the Australian Capital Territory, um, which is where our, it's like our national capital. So that's where um, the national, the federal parliament and stuff is. Did like your Washington, is that? Like Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., yeah. So anyway, uh, so just so you know, so when I tell you about the very, so we have three levels of government, basically, which I think you do as well. So we have the, the federal level and the states, so that each of these will have their own state parliaments and things, and then we have local governments as well. Okay, so here's, Australia, here's Brisbane, actually. Um, so, just down the bottom there, you'll see that we actually have a river that winds around Brisbane. So there's lots of like traffic on the river, and we have city cats and ferries that go up and down the river and stuff. But we also, I thought you'd be interested. We have this beach in the middle of the river, like it's a it's a pool. <laughs> and, um, so it's called South Bank. So. But you can see on this photo here that you can see the sand, the beach, and then the river. Yeah, so it's actually on the river, and then the city on the other side. It's very healthy. And I just thought you'd like these photos of um, <coughs> koalas and the chemical kangaroos. Um, 
And this is the university that I work at. It's the University of Queensland. So I'm in Brisbane in Queensland. So um, in Australia, we have a number of universities that are called the sandstone universities. And so uh, this is one of them. Sorry? I'm talking then, oh, sorry. Good. <laughs> sorry, I thought you were signaling to me. Um, so this is one of the sandstone universities. So it's one of the older ones. And um, so for us, it's a research intensive university. So we have a number of different universities, but this, this for a long time was kind of the main one in Queensland, which of course the parts of the University of Queensland. So you can see that we've got like the top ones are photos of the, it's called the Great Court. So it's like a D shape um, with buildings and there's the cloisters that go all the way around. Um, and then you can see an aerial view of the university. So you can see we're on a peninsula in the river. And that's the, the university, all the buildings and stuff. And right in the middle there, you can see the long thing, which is part of the D. Um, when we had floods in Brisbane, a lot of the university floods, so where all the, the buildings are is actually on higher ground, so everything around the river is will probably be in flood. So all the tennis courts and the so that's why I love the playing fields and things like that down there. So it doesn't flood so much. So what I thought you'd just be interested in, you might not be, but anyway. Um, I thought what would be interesting is to talk about how we get government because that seems to be quite different from how you do. And then, as I said, I won't labour of the organisation of the government. Then I, I um, thought I'd talk to you about an example of a service, so mental health services in, in Australia because they seem to be we seem to have, particularly in the community services, that are organised quite differently from in the States. <coughs> and then I'll give you kind of the details of how OT works in Australia as well. So we have, uh, we don't have fixed terms like, uh, I think your presidential elections are every four years or something. So we don't have fixed terms for that. We have a government that's determined by, we don't have presidential elections. We actually vote for um, our House of Representatives. So each area votes for their representative and then they will be part of a party and then whoever is the leader of the party that wins the election will then be the Prime Minister. So um, in the last couple of years, we had you know a party that had in fighting. So we had the um, the prime minister change a couple of times just because the party voted them out or in or whatever. We also have compulsory voting, which seems a bit different to you. So everyone in Australia has to vote, and you could be fined if you don't. Um, so uh, in the lead up to voting, people are not trying to get you to come and vote because you have to anyway. So then it's really just a question of who you're going to vote for rather than whether you're going to vote. Um, and similarly to you, we have our House of Representatives and our Senate. I think you call it um, Congress, is that right? Yeah, the two together. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we have like a lower house and an upper house. I think it's the, um, the uh, system. So here's a picture of our um, very cool um, parliament house, a federal one. And what's really amazing about it, it's a really amazing building when you go inside. It's got these incredible columns that looks like a forest. And, you know, it, like just wood from all over Australia. It's pretty quite amazing. 
Um, but also what's really quite interesting is at the top, it's actually all worn. So if you were to look down on it, it just looks like a piece of lawn with a black hole. It doesn't look like a building. Yeah. So just um, so to turn about the uh, healthcare system, we have a mixture of public and private. And uh, so if, if you put the US on one end of um, you mainly have private health, and if you put UK on the other, they mainly have national health. So we have a combination of both. Um, so we have like you know public hospitals and community health services and all that. They're all publicly funded, but we also have private hospitals and private services and um, you know people who work in private practices. So with OTs, for instance. Most OTs will be working in the public system, but there will also be um, an, an increasing number of OTs who have their own private practices. And then, you know, then people will pay these directly. Go to them. We have Medicare, um, which I think Oh, you have Medicaid and Medicare, and I get confused yeah, about so that. so our Medicare is just for older adults, but your okay. Medicare is Our Medicare is for everyone, so it's universal, okay. Um, so it started, I know, in the early 80s, I think, and basically the idea was, and it's part of that kind of, you know, public health push at that, at that time, the World Health um, Organization, the, the kind of health promotion push was the idea was that everyone should be able to go to the doctor for nothing regardless of how much you earn. So um, that's how Medicare worked in, works, worked in Australia. Now there's like a schedule fee and then at some point people were able to charge more than the schedule fee so there'll be like what Medicare will reimburse and there'll be a gap quite often. But if people don't want to um, charge more, then they can just buy the bill and it will cost you a And the way it's funded is that 1.5% um, uh, of income, uh, when you pay your income tax, then you get the goes on top. Um, Sorry, I'm kind of going in and out here. Um, so everyone paid hey, their 1.5% of what your um, income will be. Um, except that income earners. So there's a point at which it doesn't kick in and it's certain amount. Um, and then you start to get a battery, maybe at the so we also have the pharmaceutical investment. So um, that means that basically medications, quite you know, most medications will be on the PBS and the people will you know rather than having double medication rather than two and the government will The way it works is that um, most of the trust will be publicly funded by the federal and state governments, <coughs> and quite often they're kind of responsible for the different things. So, um, so can I just take some? Yeah, I think so.
One, two, three. All right. Okay. Um, that's better. Uh, it is better, isn't it? Um, here, Barb, just for the... Oh, no, it's going... It's turning on and off. Huh? Turning on and off. Here, can you try to do it? You just do it. Okay. Um, no, it's just too, it's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so just to say to you that we have, um, you know, things to be funded at different levels. So aged care, for example, mainly is funded at the campus level. So, um, and, and states have always been responsible for things like uh, hospitals and things like that. Um, and then there's the out-of-pocket expenses. So as I said, there's a gap that people pay for. So just to give you an example then, um, what I've come to realise is that, um, and I think it's because we have the public part of our system when I think about it, that we actually have quite a few um, community services that have multidisciplinary teams. So I thought I'd give an example of mental health because I, I know very well. Um, and also, in uh, the very early 90s, we had a human rights commission um, investigation into mental health. And since 1992, we've actually had a series of like federal um, mental health strategies. And so because of that, we've actually had a lot of policy and development legislation related to mental health. And then since that time, um, we've had then federal national strategies that have related to other things. So we have a, a national aging policy and or strategy and um, uh, disability um, and education. So they're at the national revolution. So in terms of mental health, if, if someone needed services, they would probably go to a community mental health service, which would have the full um, multidisciplinary team. So it did have um, psychiatrists, it did have um, uh, OTs, uh, social workers and um, psychologists. Psychologists, yeah. thank you, and mental health nurses. So we mainly have those two people. And so you you would go if you're a client, you would go and see whoever. Usually they work on a case management model. So you have at least your doctor and your case manager, and your case manager would be assigned because they match. You know, like you need a psychologist more than somebody else, or you need more, an OT more than somebody else. So they'll match who your your case manager is. Um, but then you could go and see other people in the team as well. It's not like you can't see anybody else. And the teams will have meetings where they'll get together and talk about their clients. So the whole team. If that person requires hospitalisation, then they'll go into hospital. And what can happen is that the case manager can keep seeing them and keep looking at them. So even though a hospital will also have its multidisciplinary team, there's a very integrated uh, service so that people don't. In, in the old days when I used to work in mental health, you'd be in the community and then someone would go in a hospital and you'd have to stop seeing them. And they'd be seen by a different team and then they'd be referred back. So now it's a much more integral service. Um, so we have this community of continuity of care. And the other thing I thought, I think what's happened very much, particularly finished the fourth mental health plan, so since uh, 1992. And one of the things that people are much more aware of is the need for intersectoral 
so not just the health service. So there was quite a bit of training, um, you know, for police, so that they know when people are not behaving, you know, behaving strangely, that they they know how to interact with them in a way that just isn't, you know, take down or shoot them or do whatever. And, and similarly with um, ambulance and emergency services, you know, how to handle people and understand the whole issue so you can get people safely in the hospital. And, and we also have, um, you know, if um, uh, carers or family members are concerned about somebody, then um, there, there's different legislation that allows us to Someone could go into the community and be assessed by some staff from the uh, from the community mental health service. Um, and there's also legislation that um, it's like you can be. We have a mental health act, which means that you can be required to have services, but only for three days, and then it's reviewed, and then can be longer. And then it's reviewed again after a certain amount of time, so it's sort of increasing time. Um, so, but it's always reviewed by the mental health tribunal, so that people can't just, you know, be institutionalised or something like that. But OTs are pretty integral to the whole system. Absolutely. So yeah. They're absolutely part of the, uh, of the whole continuity. And the continuity of care is much more needed yeah. together. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. 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 yeah, so it's real different in Australia in terms of continuity of care. It sounds like it in the States for mental health. Uh huh. Uh huh. But yeah. they have to have yeah. a theme is related to the, the public services because if you're a private patient,
So with the OT part of Australia, then it will have things that um, tells you about what the registration standards are. There are four of them, and you have to meet them. Um, and uh, and so if you wanted to apply to, if you wanted to go and work in Australia, then you have to be registered there through our friends. And so just go onto their website and they'll tell you what the cost standards are and, and it'll tell you how you go about questions. Um, it also gives codes and guidelines, so it's a really good thing for like just codes of practice guidelines and call conduct and things like that. So it's quite And then uh, this is just from OG Australia, so this is our one professional body and, and so I just thought I'll put that up because we probably want this very, very similar to the kind of areas that actually is working here. Not coders, there's 300 and something. Um, 
Bakıyorsa 